is a continuation from yesterday. Each one of us has been brought up in many kinds of fear and greed. Because of fear and greed, you go on believing in a certain idea of God. That idea is as absurd as is your greed and fear. It has nothing to do with God. It has something to do with you and your psychology. If you really want to know what God is, then you have to drop all kinds of fear and all kinds of greed. You will have to drop, in reality, your whole psychology, whole mind, your whole conditioning has to be dropped. God is an experience of the state of no mind. Remember God is an experience of the state of no mind. Fana. When you are no more dissolved, then you know what God is, what godliness is. A few things you have to understand. God is not a concept, a theory, a hypothesis, an explanation, a philosophy. None of these things can represent God in any way. How can you make a concept of something that you do not know? You do not know God. You have never encountered God. I am not using the word, the pronoun him purposely. You have never encountered God. So whatsoever you think about God is borrowed, is pseudo. The real has to be your experience. Otherwise, God remains a kind of explanation because there are problems in life. There are puzzles in life and there are mysteries as well. And you always find it difficult to explain them. Birth is there, death is there, and this whole tremendously beautiful existence as well. From where does it come? Who creates it? Why is it created? Why is it at all? Why is it rather than not? A thousand and one questions arise in human mind and you need some comfortable, convenient explanation so you can rest and sleep well. It seems God is a blanket explanation. It covers all your problems in a single concept you explain everything. Whenever you say God knows, you simply mean I do not, but it is a tricky strategy. You do not say I do not know, instead you say God knows. It gives you a feeling that you may not know, but there is somebody who knows. Mother knows, God knows, somebody else knows, so why bother? You can remain undisturbed, but let me tell you, God is not an explanation. And those who cling to explanations will never know what God is. God is the dropping away of all explanations all theories and philosophies, dropping away of all kinds of thinking because thinking is a barrier. How can you think about the unknown? You can think about that which is known. Thinking is just chewing the same thing over and over again. You can think only that which you have known already. Thinking never gives you anything original. It cannot. It is not in the nature of 
thinking and god is the most unknowable unknown and unknowable phenomena god means the totality it is not known all explanations are kind of deception deceiving yourself deceiving others that you know a sincere and honest seeker will drop all explanations that is what meant when al hilaj mansur says it is the gathering together and then the silence the silence which comes when you drop all explanations all theories all philosophies then the loss of words then the words are not needed at all and when words are not needed when all theories and all explanations and philosophies have been dropped what are you going to do with words then the loss of words and the awareness when words are lost there is silence and in that silence awareness dawns then discovering and the nakedness you are utterly naked innocent before god you have to be utterly naked with no explanation no philosophies surrounding you you have to be naked as possible totally nude empty undressed only then is there a possibility of contacting that which is god is not a person that is the second thing to remember which almost everyone mistakes it is human to think about god as a person when we think about god as a person it looks warmer lausi says tau but tau does not mean so warm you cannot hug tau tau cannot hug you buddha says dham the law the cosmic law but the law seems to be cold you need some warm embrace you need a god who can love you who can care is you who can kiss you who can take you close who can hold your hands this is human desire desire for a certain kind of warmth but existence has no obligation to fulfill your desires your desire is all right but your desire simply shows that you are missing love not god try to understand it your desire simply shows you have missed your parents your mother your father or you have missed your beloved your desire simply shows that there is some kind of hankering for love that you are projecting on to god so god becomes a person you transform god into a person because of your need but this is your need and there is no necessity that your need has to be fulfilled you have to understand your need and drop it that is why i insist that never remain unfulfilled as far as your love is concerned otherwise you will never find god love as much as you can and you have to begin with loving yourself only then the reservoir of love begins to flow deep within then it is it begins to flow in many streams all around and you begin to share that which you are love trees love rocks mountains rivers and whatever you do love as much as you can 
Love does not mean you have to love your beloved or lover alone. You can love anything. You can love your profession. You love, you can love the way you do your things. Let there be great experience of love so that your love need is fulfilled. In many ways I have to tell some the people to do this or that, that is simply to fulfill the love needs. Because of the need for love they go on faltering in many ways and never come out and fall into a state of depression never to come out of that. Let there be a great experience of love so that your love need is fulfilled and one day you can transcend love. Just a perfect lover is one who is happy alone when he is with his beloved or lover he is happy again there is no difference and when this happens under all circumstances and situations with people or alone he is happy he is a perfect lover he is happy as alone if you want to be an embodiment of love first you have to be fulfilled about your human love needs otherwise Krishna will be false it will not be a Mira's Krishna your Krishna will be your imagination and it will be a projection of your repressed desire your Krishna will have much sexuality in it first we finished with human needs that is why Sufis emphasize on getting married but again it is an individual phenomenon if you had had the experience then you do not need to go to some people I have to tell to go into your past lives. It happened with Shankaracharya, the Adi Shankar. He entered into an argument that was the kind of thing that used to happen during the time. In order to establish his superiority, he has to enter into a debate with the most prestigious person. He enters into his enters into a debate with Mandan Mishra. He defeated him. When Mandan got defeated, his wife came in. He, she said, "Wife is a part of husband. Husband is incomplete without wife. That is a half and half." that makes a full marriage makes the two complete unless you can defeat me in debate Mandan has not been defeated she asked him a question what about love Shankar had no experience of marriage he entered he did not follow the Buddhist way Otherwise he could have gone to his past lives in one of the lives he must have had a love relation going into that relieving that gives a different kind of fulfillment which never comes with anything else and it is said through his intuition he realized the king was dying he gathered his disciples, he left his body and entered into that body of the dead king who was dying. In order to maintain the warmth of the body, all his disciples have to remain surrounding the body of Shankar so that during that period the body 
remains in a certain kind of warmth so that the soul can return and enter the same body. He entered into the body of the king who was dying, remained there for six months and he came back and he explained all that was needed to win that debate with the wife of Mandan Mission. This is one way. But the way of Buddha is going back into your past lives. And there you will be able to discover even if you are getting a disturbance in your current love relation, you can remember the Rose Abbal, the day one, when you had met your spouse, how love flourished in you. And slowly and slowly it began to gather momentum. It overwhelmed you. Remembering this, you are relieving those moments. Earlier on when you fell in love, you lived those moments unconsciously. Now meditatively you are living those moments consciously. And when something is lived consciously, it gives a different kind of satiation which does not come in any other way. This is one of the meditation which each one of us have to do in order to know the real essence of love. Go into your past relations. Now there is no one to hurt you. No one has to create any problem for you. You are all alone sitting in your meditation contemplating on how this is started, how it came to an end. There will be pain, maybe, but you are to overcome that pain and this is the way you can transcend beyond love. Your Krishna will be just your imagination if love is not fulfilled. Your Krishna will have much sexuality. First be finished with human needs and the only way to be finished is to go into them meditatively. You can reflect back as I mentioned. I am not against them. Remember, I am not against anything and do not see anything wrong in them. There is a great lesson that one can learn and it can be learned only by going through it. Go through them. Do not demand the impossible, otherwise love will not happen. Remember the limitations of human beings and your as well. And what's whenever and whatsoever kind of love is possible, go into it. Do not hanker for the impossible, otherwise you will miss even the possible. And the impossible cannot happen. The impossible happens only the other way around. Go through the possible, let the possible be finished with let your being come out of it fulfilled, then impossible can also happen. You have become capable of it. If your love needs are not fulfilled and you go on projecting onto God, the poor God has to suffer unnecessarily. First go through human turmoil, human anguish, the joy of human love and the miseries of love as well. Let yourself become ripe through it. Then only do you have the fragrance which can be offered to God, not before it. First become a lotus. Come out of the mud of desire. That is why it is considered a sacred symbol. Mud represents all kind of desire. 
And out of that blossoms the lotus of love. And remember the lotus comes out of mud. Out of the desiring comes the state of desirelessness. Lotus represents unattachment, a state of desirelessness. The lotus of desirelessness. Seeing the futility of desire again and again and again. One day one becomes so mature that all desires vanish. In that very dropping is the meeting. When there is no desire, there is nothing to hinder you from seeing God. Then God is all over the place. Then only God is and God is not a person. It is the totality. Christians say God is a father. God is not a father. They simply show somehow that your father need remains unfulfilled. There are people who say God is mother. They simply show that their mother need remains unfulfilled. There are some who think God is a lover. Then their love need is not fulfilled. What you say about God says something about you. If you think God as a father, it, sim it simply shows you are unsatisfied with your father, that you are not reconciled with him, that you have become too much dependent on your father. You need a father in the sky now. Maybe your father is dead and you cannot live without a father or maybe your father is far away and you cannot live without him. You are still immature and childish. You need somebody to cling to. Then you will create God the Father. God is neither father nor mother nor lover nor beloved. God is not a person at all. God is energy, cosmic energy. God is continuous creativity that is happening. That is why Hindu says the Aham Brahmasmi, ever expanding consciousness that goes on expanding moment to moment. God is love, life, light. God is not an object of experience either. It is not that one day you will encounter God as an object of experience. God is not an object and God is not a subject either. When subject and object meet and disappear into one another, fana happens. Then there is a new kind of experience. Krishnamurti calls experiencing. It is not even experience because the very word experience seems to be finished, complete and rounded. It is a noun. Instead of noun, the verb is important, rivering. You, the process of flowing of the river is called rivering. It is always an ongoing affair, always open, always flowering, always moving. God is a dynamic energy, a process, not a thing. So an experiencing, and what is an experiencing? What is the difference between experience and experiencing? The difference is that in experience you remain separate from the object. For example, you are listening to me. This can happen in two ways. For those who are here, who are listening just as a spectator, as a listener, as an audience, it is an experience. For them, it remains an experience. I am here separate from them and they are separate from me. I am an object and they are the subject because they are listening to me. They are there centered in their egos. 
listening to me agreeing with some things that i say disagreeing with things that with other things they are continuously judging whether this is right or wrong it fits in with their conditioning or not and they are continuously judging whether this applies or not whether this can be practiced or not whether this agrees with their scriptures or not they are continuously judging goes on within this is known as experience but there are those who are in deep love with me who are not standing against me and it does not matter to me what i am speaking what matters to them is that i am there the speaking is happening and it is a flow of energy for them they are drowning in it they are enjoying every sip of it as it is brewed and is poured into your cup moment to moment the brew that is constantly being prepared is poured into your cup they are in love with me not standing against me who are not there as a subject listening to me who get lost into it who are enwrapped with me involved with me involved with me as if they are listening to themselves to their own heartbeat the two heartbeats are one they are beating at the same piece then there is not an experience but experience then i am not separate from them and they are not separate from me then there is a union a fusion as alilaj calls it a union a fusion two have merged into one another god is an experience god is an experience if you want to know what god is you have to learn the art of experiencing then there is no need to go to a mosque or to a temple or to a church wherever experiencing happens a church is there a temple is there a mosque is there looking at the rose flower if you disappear into the rose flower and rose flower disappears into you the observer becomes the observed and there is no distinction left they are not two things confronting each other but a meeting a merger a melting into each other then boundaries are no longer there somehow you have entered into the rose and rose has entered into you and this is possible this is transfiguration and it is possible because it is possible religion is relevant meaningful otherwise religion will not be meaningful being with the rose flower you enter into god all possibilities can be used as doors to the divine yes there is death there is life but both are intertwined seeing both together one transcends one transcends to a higher peak then one is no longer dominated by any standpoint you see life and death as part of each other then you are so transcendental to both that you see eternity then there is neither beauty nor ugliness there is simply truth beauty is choosing one standpoint ugliness is choosing another standpoint 
and truth is beyond both beauty and ugliness it is not choosing any standpoint truth is not choosing god is not any aspect of reality god is all aspects together without any choice if you choice you miss if you do not choice there is no way to miss but there is a problem when you choose you can remain yourself all choices feeds human ego when you do not choose you disappear you disappear with your choice likes dislikes you cannot exist without choosing without taking a stand point without being for or against once you do not take any stand point you disappear in that disappearance god is you will never meet god remember nobody has ever met god when people say they have met god what they mean is that they have disappeared only god is ego disappears and then there is experience a continuity continuous constant eternal that energy that overflowing energy is what god is so remember god is not an object of experience neither is he the subject of experience god is the process experiencing itself god is not a static but a process evolving expanding exploding exploding it goes on and on it is an adventure a pilgrimage from nowhere to nowhere from now here to now here this word nowhere is beautiful you can pronounce it as nowhere as well as now here just look at the beauty of this word god is not there in the heavens or somewhere else god is not there god is here god is not then god is now and god is not that god is this if you can understand these few words here now this these three words are three pillars of sufism of zen of all that is eternal religion here now this these three words let them vibrate in your being again and again here now this and you have entered into an unfathomable reservoir those who think of god as that far away somewhere else they are just imagining and missing the obvious which is just close by is not there he, it's here god is not far away he is closer than you are to yourself he is your innermost core how can you be far away and god is not then there in the past in the future it is not that god used to walk in the days of moses and talk to people it is not that god used to talk to muhammad and will not talk to you it is not that he used to sing songs to the seers of upanishad and he has forgotten you or abandoned you it's not that god appeared as krishna to arjun to give him the message of bhagavad gita god is always now god is never past never future in relation to god past and future are meaningless words you cannot say god was you cannot say god will be you have always 
have to say God is. There is only one tense present. And it is a very precise and delicate, you cannot encompass into any time frame. And God is here this very moment. If you can be in the state of experiencing, God is here now this. If you cannot be in the state of experiencing, God is never nowhere. Then this word is pronounced as nowhere. This state of experiencing is what Sufis call as meditation. Then the world becomes here now. But this God here now, this is a dangerous God. You have to disappear for it to be. You have to dissolve into it. It is risky. We have created substitutes to avoid it. No, it is not that God has chosen some people. You have chosen to be God's chosen people. Then you suffer. Jews have suffered for a really long time and all their misery can be condensed into this single thing. They have chosen to be the chosen people of God. That very ego has created great antagonism and they are stubbornly clinging to it. The more they have suffered, the more stubborn they have become. But God is not. God has not chosen anybody. How can God choose? All is His. All is He. There is no question of choice. But we choose our ideas and, and then those ideas become prisons, calamities. Be aware of this. If you are suffering, then look back. You must have chosen something wrong, otherwise you cannot suffer. This is my basic observation after observing thousands of people and their miseries. Whenever I see somebody suffering and in misery, I have by and by become absolutely certain about one thing that he is responsible for his suffering. That he has chosen some wrong ideas, that he has chosen some wrong notions, but those who suffer always throw the responsibility on others and sometimes it seems very unjust. If a couple comes to me and the wife or the husband is miserable but rather than but the other partner is not miserable at all, the miserable partner tries to throw the responsibility on others. He is responsible for my misery. It seems very hard to tell the person who is in misery that he must be responsible for his or her own misery because nobody else can be responsible for your misery. If other is happy, he must have chosen different values. He must have chosen values that give him happiness, health and wholeness. If you have chosen wrong values, you suffer. But you can always manipulate and interpret in such a way that your suffering seems as if he has done something to you. Nobody can make you suffer. It is always basically you who decide whether to suffer or not. In every situation you take a standpoint from which you can get out of suffering. In every situation you can take a standpoint from which you can come out of it. That's why it is important that you have to make your own choice to be happy or not to be. To be in suffering or not. But people like to suffer. There is a reason for it. The more they suffer, the more they are. In suffering, the ego feels strengthened. In bliss, ego disappears. If you go on saying that you need bliss, 
that you seek bliss but when I look into you I find just the opposite you seek misery you live on misery you look for misery you go on saying that you seek bliss but you go on looking for misery unless mechanism is understood perfectly well you will never be able to know what God is God is bliss and bliss is possible only when you have understood the phenomena how you create your misery substitute substitutes create misery now this is small parable Imam Muhammad Bakir is said to have related this illustrative fable finding I could speak the language of ants I approached to one and inquired what is God like does he resemble the ant he answered God no indeed we have only one sting but God has two that is how your religions and philosophies are God is just your magnified form you have one sting he has two you live 70 years he lives eternity you become old he never becomes old but the difference is of quantity not of quality you are made of the same stuff that God is made of your God is your projected reformed modified decorated form your God is you as you would like it to be it's up to you how you look at it